It's a trap. Marvel Studios is setting up a trap. Okay, so about a year and a half ago, Marvel Studios said that not only is Daredevil going to be part of the MCU, but he will be in the series called Daredevil Born Again. Comic fans, especially Daredevil fans, know and understood what this title means and we're starting to get hyped. Here's the problem though. As of most things with the MCU, when they adapt storylines, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Either it'll be in name only or may sort of only touch a couple of the themes of said storyline. Case in point, Thor Ragnarok and its comic equivalent as well as their masterization of Planet Hulk. But that's a whole nother story. So I didn't expect much will be taken from the 1980s Frank Miller written story other than the name and a couple of scenes. But hey, let's take a look at the original work anyway. But first, a brief recap on Daredevil's origin. Eh, it's close enough. Here's what the back of the graphic novel says. The definitive Daredevil tale by industry legends Frank Miller and David Mazzuccelli. Karen Page, Matt Murdock's former lover, has traded away the man without fear's secret identity for a drug fix. Now Daredevil must find the strength as the kingpin of crime wastes no time taking him down as low as a human can get. Collecting Daredevil issues 226 to 233. The story begins with us seeing what looks like a Mad Max version of a samurai being the crap out of a guy. While this is happening, Matt's friend and law partner Foggy Nelson has a meet cute with a woman named Glory. Due to recent events, their law firm is shutting down. It seems that the half-naked man is a former client of theirs named Melvin Potter, aka The Gladiator. Elsewhere, Matt is sulky on a war tower going over his troubles and then he has a memory about his old teacher stick, which amounts to suck it up and take accountability and stop blaming everyone for your troubles. It seems he's not ready to hear that, especially after he hears that Melvin is at it again. Wait, Foggy and Glory are having a date? And they discuss the change in Matt's attitude lately. It looks like Glory was dating Matt, but after several personal losses, he started to change. Man, Foggy is laying a serious amount of game on her. But you know, maybe he shouldn't be saying this right here. The next couple of pages go back and forth between Matt blaming everyone else for his problems and Foggy and Glory's date. Man, I bet 90% of men would want to have a woman look at them the same way that Glory is looking at Foggy right now. While still in the mood at their old office, Matt receives a desperate message from Melvin. Once he meets up with Melvin in his gladiator gift, he just proceeds to beat the crap out of him, just not even wanting to listen to his reasons. After Melvin gets whopped, he begs Daredevil to save his wife, I think? It seems that he put on the armor again because he wanted to save her, but he's in no shape to do it. It's taken a while, but finally Matt is out of his head, for at least a moment, and he's ashamed for how he's been acting. They team up and track her down and are able to save her. While they save her, Matt still seems to feel a bit unsettled. In a seedy, smoke-filled, barely lit room, a cracked out adult actress is offering a man some information. The lady is Matt's former girlfriend and his and Foggy's former secretary, Karen Page. She's given up Daredevil secret ID for a hit. This information unfortunately makes it way to Wilson Fisk, AKA the Kingpin of Crime. Fisk decides to test the information now. Elsewhere, Matt wakes up at home and checks his mail thinking that it's a bunch of job offers. Nah, it's just a ton of bills instead. You know, somewhere Peter Parker is laughing his head off. Things go worse for him while on the phone with his accountant who quits, Glory leaves a message breaking up with him. Gee, let me guess who she's gonna end up with. I'm not saying she doesn't have a good reason to break up with Matt, but possibly then hooking up with his closest friend isn't cool, man. Even more crap is dumped on him when he gets a subpoena saying that he paid off a witness to perjure himself. While that's happening, Foggy meets up with Glory, but her apartment has been ransacked. 
Meanwhile, at the Daily Bugle, Matt's newsman friend Ben Yurick on the AP wire got the information about Matt facing bribery, perjury, and misconduct charges. When he tries to call and talk to Matt, Matt just laughs and hangs up on him. Spoiler, Matt won't be laughing for much longer. Matt finds out that the bank is about to foreclose on his home, so he decides to make the rounds as Daredevil. While that's happening, Gloria's at Foggy's place because she didn't feel safe at hers, and she starts to come on to him. Realizing this, he decides it's bedtime, but he'll take the couch. That last image of Gloria imagining, she's thinking, I want you to take something else. An honest cop named Nick implied that Matt paid someone off, so he, as Daredevil, visits him at home and asks Nick why he lied. Nick's response? Attacking Red with a broken bottle. Matt immediately leaves, but once he does, Nick calls one of the Kingpin's goons and tells him what happened. Apparently, they made a deal with him that if he lies, then they'll pay for his son's medical treatment. Just goes to show you that Everyone has a price. Matt heard the entire conversation. When he goes home, his power and telephone are turned off. He does manage to contact Foggy from a phone booth and gives him the lowdown of the situation. You know what's interesting about Fisk tearing apart Matt's life? It's not him taking glee and seeing his deterioration, but it's that he still has no hard proof, only circumstantial that Matt's daredevil. What's really disturbing isn't that he's enjoying it, is that if he found out that Matt wasn't Daredevil, it wouldn't even matter. Wilson Fisk is just that trash of a human being. Sometime later, Foggy does his best to defend Matt in court, and while Matt doesn't get any prison time, he does get disbarred. Fisk likes this decision and even considers that in the future, he may even hire Matt Murlock after he goes through even more poverty and shame because he wants him to know just how powerless he is compared to him. However, Fisk can't help himself. He wants to deliver the killing stroke, but says he has to deny himself of it. Uh-huh, sure, buddy. Somewhere else, Karen is running like a mad woman being chased by a guy firing at her. Her only thought, Matt. Matt can save her. Really, Lay? Really? You destroyed his life in order to get a hit, and now you want him to help you? Ugh. While that's happening, Matt's about to enter his house, which will be repossessed soon, and he's thinking irrationally that maybe multiple enemies are after him like the IRS, Ma Bell, now AT&T, Con Ed, and Glory. He thinks Foggy is in on the conspiracy against them as well. He thinks that until his brownstone blows up right in front of him. Amongst the rubble, he finds his costume and immediately knows who's behind this. Matt calls and leaves a confusing message for Foggy. We next see Matt in a tiny room trying to figure out his next step, to murk the kingpin or not. We next see Wilson Fisk looking out into the sea. He says that he sees Daredevil as a mere annoyance, a fly, and Wilson is basically a little kid torching the fly for mild amusement. However, just like Matt has been obsessed all this time, so has Fisk. This can just stop right now, but no. He wants to torture Matt more and have him torn limb from limb for his own pleasure. Matt, still stuck in his head and an $8 hotel room, is going round and round. Should he call Foggy again? Go after the kingpin? Eat? Go to the gym? Or just sleep? After choking out the hotel manager thinking that the kingpin sent him, he didn't. Wilson Fisk is being given the rundown of every single movement of Matt so far. Matt's now off the edge. While on the train, he's attacked by some violent youths, but he takes them out as well as a cop, and he steals the cop's billy club. Fisk knows that Matt's on his way to fight him. Before that, Matt calls Foggy again and delivers more ramblings. But in panel four, I think it's pretty obvious that this time he never called Foggy. He was just talking to himself. Somewhere else, Karen's trying to contact Matt, but the operator says that his line's been disconnected. I wonder if Karen considers this karma for all the trouble she's caused so far. During all this, Ben Yurk is trying to convince J. Jonah Jameson to write a story on the Kingpin and Matt Murdock thing. Matt arrives at Fisk Industries and proceeds to get mollywopped by a fat man in a Speedo. 
Now, instead of just outright killing him, Fisk has his men put Matt in a taxi and then dump it into the river to leave him to die. He didn't want to make Matt's death mysterious or suspicious. Yeah, make it look like a desperate man tried to delete himself. Matt goes missing in the public eye for weeks. There's just one problem. The cab was discovered, but there is no corpse. The issue opens with an unconscious Matt recapping his origin story and background under several pages of text. We next see Foggy and Glory on a date. Are they official now? A thief tries to rob her, but Foggy strikes the thief in the face with either a bowling ball or cannonball. Somehow, the thief doesn't die and just runs away. Vineyard continues investigating his Matt Murdock kingpin story and leads him to Bellevue Hospital, where the honest cop Nick is there with his sick son. Ben tells him he knows why he did, and he's not the first cop to go bad. Yeah, and he's certainly not going to be the last. The irony here is that it looks like Nick's son may not even make it through the night. So congratulations, you became a crooked cop, played a major role in destroying a good man's life, and your son is still most likely going to die under the same time frame as before. So all of that for nothing. It's now Christmas Eve and Karen is stumbling around town getting attacked by drugged out homeless people. I wonder, did the Kingpin put out a hit on her too or is this just Karen's paranoia running wild? While that's happening, Matt is getting hit by a car and robbed by Santa and his little helper. On a happier note, Foggy tells his mom on the phone he's gotten some job offers and met a new girl. Back at Bellevue, Ben finds out that Nick's son just died. Finally, Nick starts to admit to everything, but I don't know, there's something very suspicious about that nurse. Meanwhile, Matt is currently strolling the streets with a wound in his stomach, and Kara is having a meeting with a fan, which is interrupted when a couple of gentlemen come to retrieve her. Matt makes it to Hell's Kitchen looking for something. Meanwhile, Foggy is giving Glory a new necklace. Yeesh, they're really moving fast. Yes, I get by this point it's been over a month, but still. Elsewhere, Ben and Nick are talking. Nick is showing some regret when he says, sold out, 29 year without fixing a ticket and I sell out and doesn't even save my boy. Yep, pretty much. At that moment, the hulked out nurse Ratchet reveals that she works for the Kingpin. She proceeds to break Ben's fingers on one of his hands and tells him, every time you speak the name Matthew Murdoch, you shall lose the use of your fingers. Isn't the healthcare model do no harm? So she doesn't kill him, but she allows him to see what she does to honest cop Nick. I'm guessing the father is about to meet up with the son. Matt's current goal is to get back to his father's place and his father's gym. He collapses and is found by none. While that's happening, it looks like Karen is selling herself for more smack. I gotta wonder, just what did she think if she ever did find Matt that he's going to one forgive her and two snap his fingers making her life instantly better well considering this is Matt we're talking about number one is probably unfortunately a given one of the best parts of this issue is when we get inside of the kingpin's head where the same words keep going through his mind there is no corpse someone who he said was only annoyance and inconvenience is now a problem he did everything he could to break him, and yet Matt just keeps getting up and moving forward. Fisk realizes that Matt has always been a bigger threat than he was willing to admit. Matt said it best in a line later in the story. I have shown him that a man without hope is a man without fear. 